Hi everyone, this is episode 329 and it's me Scott Reeves and we're going to continue on with vitamin K here. So we got through quite a bit of vitamin K and um, hopefully it's straightforward so far. Remember there's a few different molecules that actually have vit what we call vitamin K activity and we've said that uh, phyloquinone is a plant source, tends to be the most common source in our diets and um, minoquinone is one that's made by bacteria. There's several different forms of minoquinones and they do function as vitamin K though. Remember they have this same structure over here. Let me find my cursor. Structure's the same between phyloquinone and minoquinone. So this is the part of the molecule that actually functions in the vitamin K cycle that we're gonna look at today. And then we have minodione, which is actually a synthetic form of uh, vitamin K. It can be converted to minoquinone and that's by the addition of a tail here right here in the liver and then it can function as vitamin K but remember minodione is the synthetic form we talked about sources and we said uh, excellent sources are leafy green vegetables and some oils and margarine they used to think that we actually got more vitamin K from oils and margarine but now we know that leafy green vegetables can be a really significant source and it's absorbed at probably about the same efficiency and effectiveness as those from oils. Uh, we looked at some sources. We talked about adequate intakes and how it's recently changed from an RDA to an AI. And oh, sorry, that's 14 years ago now, but fairly recently changed. Um, and we said that in general, though, in the U.S., people probably still aren't getting enough vitamin K. Um, and um, we said there's no UL. But we said that it's absorbed, transported through, through lipoproteins. We went through that. We said the main functions of vitamin K is it actually is involved in post-translational modification of some proteins. And this is where the uh, glutamate residue is converted to what we call a GLA residue. And that's the addition of an additional carboxylic acid group to the side chain of glutamate making it GLA allowing it to then bind calcium and then that that GLA protein can then react with other cell components and that's like phospholipids to affect the blood clotting and bone mineralization among other processes but it can also interact with um, other molecules as part of that blood clotting cascade we said two great examples of carboxylated or GLA proteins are prothrombin. The other one is osteocalcin. We know that prothrombin is a blood clotting factor, but osteocalcin is a, is a protein that's involved in bone mineralization. Um, briefly talked about this, and I said that you want to know that, for example, factor X or factor 10 is converted to factor 10A with vitamin K and calcium basically through carboxylation of factor 10 and then the addition of calcium that allows it to convert prothrombin to thrombin remember prothrombin is also a, a GLA protein it's converted to thrombin which then converts fibrinogen to fibrin and that's what forms that that mesh like structure of a clot and I said that, you know, overall, there's about 10 clotting factors. We, we looked at this, sorry. Overall, there's 13 clotting factors, and about four of those are actually vitamin K calcium dependent. So four of the 13 blood clotting factors um, are actually vitamin K dependent. And we're going to look at this process now where We've said a few times that vitamin K is required for carboxylation. We talked about it briefly. Now we're going to specifically look at this pathway because this is, you can look at this as, this is the vitamin K activation cycle. Vitamin K activation cycle. It's how vitamin K is involved in carboxylation, but then how the vitamin K is actually reactivated after it helps in carboxylation. So you want to look at this in terms of, you want to understand, sorry, you want to know the structures of these three molecules, the structures that are shown, and you want to know the names of those molecules, and you want to know the enzymes that actually convert these molecules to each other, and you want to realize over here what's happening in this reaction. So basically you want to regenerate this drawing in, in kind of simple, 
simpler terms. So let's start over here on the left, which is number one. This is the usual form of vitamin K in the blood. And this is vitamin K quinone. So you can see here's the quinone groups, right? This is what we saw in that initial slide of vitamin K. But now we have the carbon chain that's basically been removed here. But that's represented by the R group. And I said before that this is kind of the, the business part of the molecule, these quinone groups. Okay, So it starts off here as what we call vitamin K quinone. And remember, this can be phyloquinone or it can be minoquinone. Okay, now it's oxidized in the blood, but it can go into cells and go through this cycle. In this case, vitamin K quinone, now remember this is an oxidized form, it's reduced by an enzyme called quinone reductase. And this enzyme is adding hydrogens to vitamin K quinone right here at the oxygens at the quinone, group, quinone groups to make this dihydroquinone. It's called dihydro because it now has um, two hydrogens attached. Okay, the, the hydrogens come from either NADPH or dithiol groups and this would be for example from glutathione. This dihydroquinone is also known as KH2. This is the active form of vitamin K. So you want to make a note of that. This is the active form of vitamin K, dihydroquinone. Give me one second. Sorry, brief intermission. Um, this is, oops, my cursor. KH2 is needed for gamma glutamate carboxylase to add CO2 to glutamate acids, glutamic acids in the peptide. Okay, so here's the form of vitamin K that vitamin K dependent gamma glutamate carboxylase requires. So this enzyme right here is the same one that we talked about here. Vitamin K dependent gamma glutamate carboxylase is here. Vitamin K dependent gamma glutamate carboxylase. So this is what it's doing. Remember it's taking a CO2 group and an oxygen group and basically here's a peptide, here's the side chain of glutamate and now it's adding a second carboxylic acid group. And this is a bad drawing because at physiologic pH, these carboxyl groups are deprotonated, so they're negatively charged. Okay? So here's the GLA residue. Here's the enzyme that does that, and it's using the reduced form of vitamin K in order to do that. So when it says here's the peptide, an example of this, this peptide could be prothrombin or osteocalcin or some of the other ones that we didn't uh, talk about specifically but there's quite a few proteins that are actually involved in this okay now once that occurs the vitamin K is oxidized so it goes from a dihydroquinone to a vitamin K 2,3 epoxide Okay, now it's a quinone but it also had the, has this epoxide group which is right here so an additional oxygen has been added Okay, now the vitamin K 2,3 epoxide must be converted back to KH2 for the cycle to continue. So now it's got to go all the way back to here to its active form. So in the next step, this form is reduced to vitamin K quinone. This enzyme is called epoxide reductase. It uses tends to use hydrogens from um, glutathione, from a dithiol, and that forms vitamin K quinone. And now you have back to quinone, then it goes to quinone reductase, and now the vitamin K can basically be used by the enzyme again to repeat the process. So the same vitamin K is going around this cycle to be activated, help the enzyme carboxylate an amino acid, and then it's, the vitamin K is, has to be reduced again. Okay? So if vitamin K is not reduced, it's not active. Okay? 
Now, one of the things that we want to think about is where does this actually occur in a cell? So this is where vitamin K dependent gamma carboxylase is in a cell. So here's a cell membrane. And a great example of a cell would be a liver cell because the liver cells are the ones that make the blood clotting factors. So in a liver cell, here's a cytosol. Here's a ribosome. Here's the mRNA that's translating being translated by a ribosome. Here's the mRNA. Here's the protein that's being translated. Basically, it's in the secretory pathway because the liver cell is going to secrete this blood clotting factor like prothrombin. Okay, so here's the prothrombin protein, for example, going into the inside of the RER. Now, these proteins have a signal peptide. We talked about that in 328. The signal peptide is cleaved. They also have a section called a propeptide that's part of the initial protein. Now as the protein's translated, it's finished translation, signal peptide comes off, propeptide helps, this is vitamin K dependent gamma carboxylase. The propeptide initially binds to that enzyme so that the enzyme can add the carboxylic acid group. Okay, now the enzyme has been carboxylated. So this enzyme would be using vitamin K to carboxylate it. This is inside the RER, so then the, the protein goes from the RER to the Golgi, from the cis to the medial and the trans, and the last part of the Golgi is when this little uh, propeptide is cleaved. Don't need that anymore. So now you have the fully functional protein that's now secreted from the cell, so it's exocytosed, so it can go into the blood, and when it binds calcium, it can then be activated. Okay? So one of the catches of all this is, we mentioned that vitamin K is involved in coagulation, and we said that vitamin K metabolism is important when we're dealing with anticoagulants, or what are known as blood thinners. So this shows what are vitamin K antagonists. It has four molecules here, and you can see that they all have, they all kind of look like part of phyloquinone and minoquinone, that, that quinone structure. Now, I just want to remember one of these, and that's here, warfarin. Another name for warfarin is coumadin. Okay? Warfarin and also this molecule, dicumarol, they actually block the reduction of vitamin K. So in other words, they block the activation of vitamin K. And if vitamin K is not active, it can't participate in, uh, it can't assist vitamin K-dependent gamma carboxylase. So if it's not activated, blood clotting becomes compromised. So that's how these anticoagulants work. And this diagram actually says anticoagulants such as warfarin inhibit the activity of oxide reductase. So in other words, it re it inhibits the reduction of vitamin K. It also does it here. So anticoagulants such as warfarin inhibit the activity of quinone reductase. So warfarin inhibits the two enzymes that reduce and activate vitamin K. Therefore, less vitamin K is activated, less proteins are carboxylated, and blood clotting can be inhibited. Now one of the questions with this is, you know, some individuals are on these anticoagulants for years. Now if you are inhibiting the carboxylation of blood clotting factors, theoretically you're also inhibiting the carboxylation of bone proteins like osteocalcin. So one of the interesting things would be to look at a long-term study where they're looking at anticoagulants effects on the risk of osteoporosis because theoretically it could have an effect and I haven't seen any of those studies but they might be out there but last time I looked I hadn't seen them so uh, they might be coming. Alright so other vitamin K dependent proteins we talked about osteocalcin quite a bit it's also known as bone glaw protein. Um, osteocalcin actually comprises about 15 to 20 percent of non-collagen protein in bone. It's actually one of the most um, common proteins in, in bone other than collagen. So collagen is the most 
common protein in bone. Osteocalcin is one of the other most common ones. So vitamin K-dependent carboxylation of osteocalcin results in three glow residues, which facilitate the binding of calcium. We looked at this before. Several studies have investigated the relationship between vitamin K intake and bone density, and they've looked at osteocalcin carboxylation, and there does seem to be a relationship. There is a relationship between vitamin K intake and the amount of osteocalcin that is carboxylated and it looks like that can change bone density if a person is not consuming enough vitamin K intake. So there's been a few studies that have indicated that and more coming. There's also some genetic studies that have been, in, done, been done in mice where the lack of osteocalcin was associated with alterations in bone formation. So um, and Warfarin has, or Coumadin has actually been shown to impair osteocalcin's ability to bind minerals in bone because of low carboxylation. Okay, so let's see. What else? How do we assess vitamin K status? Well, one way is to look at plasma phylloquinone concentration. So basically, you just measure the most common form of vitamin K in the blood, and you have a range where that's considered normal and sometimes a person can be above or below that range and they're they can be de uh, that can indicate a vitamin K deficiency the problem with measuring plasma phylloquinone excuse me is that it um, represents or it's affected by recent dietary intake so it's affected by recent diet, so it's not a good long-term indicator. Um, the classic thing to measure is prothrombin time test, in other words, clot formation. So they'll take a blood sample and they'll actually measure it in the lab how long it takes them to how long it takes it to clot once they initiate clotting. Um, that's considered kind of a crude method and not a very sensitive indicator of vitamin K status. Um, one of the ones that is probably more promising is they'll actually take a blood sample and look at the amount of undercarboxylated proteins in the blood. And one of the ones that they'll measure is actually osteocalcin because there's some in the blood. If it's undercarboxylated, then they, that's a, a good indicator that the person might not be consuming enough vitamin K. So this is probably going to be one that hopefully becomes more common because it tends to be a good, sensitive, long-term indicator of vitamin K status. Deficiency. Now overall, like a, a significant deficiency seems to be unlikely in healthy adults. Um, and it's likely because the bacteria in our gut synthesize some vitamin K, so it keeps us from becoming uh, significantly deficient. Uh, but a lot of people are probably marginally or less than optimal vitamin K status in, in the U.S. Um, so... The most at risk for deficiency includes, so these are likely subpopulations, newborn infants, for example, people with severe GI malabsorptive disorders, they would probably be deficient in other vitamins as well, or people being treated for long periods of time with antibiotics because they can actually affect the gut bacteria and decrease the bacteria that are synthesizing vitamin K in the gut. Now, why are newborns at risk? Uh, there's three main reasons. Number one, their food is limited to milk, and that tends to be low in vitamin K. Newborns are also at risk for because their stores of the vitamin are low due to poor placental transfer. So it doesn't go across the placental barrier very well. And the third reason is their GI is not yet populated with vitamin K-producing bacteria. Um, so that's the third reason. Their GI is not populated yet with vitamin K producing bacteria. So therefore supplementation is advisable and basically done in all newborns in the U.S. Um, and it's, it's a uh, phylloquinone injected intramuscularly into the infants soon after birth. And um, that's kind of a... Um, a safety or precautionary measure, but it is common and it is considered to be beneficial. Toxicity, no UL has been set by the Food and Nutrition Board, so large amounts of phylloquinone can be consumed and it's not considered to be harmful. 
However, minodione, the synthetic form of the vitamin, may be toxic when taken in large amounts, and it can cause um, actually it can cause the liver liver damage. I mentioned that before, and because of the liver damage, it can be associated with hemolytic anemia um, and high levels of bilirubin and severe jaundice because the liver is is kind of dysfunctional at that point. So it's not considered obviously something that a person should probably consume unless there's a, a reason not to consume the other forms of vitamin K, which um, it would be very rare. So I think that wraps up for vitamin K. That was um, pretty short, and um, I hope that went well, and um, I'm going to stop right there.